So in the body we have glands. And a gland is a cell or a structure that produces a product. And there's only two types of gland in the body. There's exocrine and there's endocrine. Exocrine and endocrine. Now exo means out as in exit. Endo means in as in endocardium, the inner layer. And first of all, we want to think about what these two types of glands do. And we're gonna start off by thinking about the exocrine glands. So we're still thinking about glands, but we're thinking about exocrine glands. What is it that they do and what are they? Well, an exocrine gland is something that produces a product and secretes it via a duct or secretes it onto a surface. So what do we mean by that? Well, for example, we might think about a sweat gland. So here we have the top layer of skin, the epidermis, and we have sweat glands that go down, deep down into the skin. That would be the layer of the epidermis there. And we see the sweat gland is going down into the dermis and it coils around like this. It's a coiled structure. And there's actually two components to this gland. What we actually have here, this is the duct. So this is the ductal portion here. And then further in, round about here, this bit is the glandular component. So this coil bit is the, the glandular part, the part that actually produces the sweat in this case. So it's producing the sweat and that sweat is rising up the sweat gland duct and it's being deposited on the surface of the skin. So it's a product and it is being secreted via a duct. So sweat glands do this. Quite a few of the glands in the gastrointestinal tract are similar to this, such as salivary glands or the gastric glands in the stomach producing gastric juices. Or the pancreas itself is actually an exocrine gland. Lacrimal glands produce tears, sebaceous glands produce sebum, mammary glands produce milk, just to give a, a few examples. Now we see that there are actually many cells, well we don't see, but this is a relatively macroscopic structure. It's small, but it's made of many cells. So lining here there will be many sec individual uh, secretory cells. So that's an example of a, of, of a multicellular exocrine gland. But others are uh, just a single cell. So for example, we might think of, um, if we think of an epithelium, perhaps in the respiratory tract, this could be a ciliated cell here. And then every so often in the respiratory mucosa, there's a different sort of cell and it's kind of like this. And when people first looked at these, they thought it was a bit like an upside down drinking goblet. You still have a nucleus in here, of course. And there's probably another more normal looking cell next door to it. Another ciliated cell there. And because these look like upside down drinking goblets, they're called goblet cells. And their job is to produce mucus, so they produce mucus. And that goes onto the surface and is a very important part of the mucociliary clearance system. So these are exocrine glands. They are producing things and secreting them via a duct. And we saw that one was multicellular and of course that one is a, a single celled a secretory gland. But there's another group of glands in the body. They're still glands. So they're still glands, but these ones are the endocrine glands. So what are the uh, endocrine glands? Well, the endocrine glands are also uh, cells. They are secretory cells that produce a product. So here we have some uh, endocrine cells in an endocrine gland. 
So these are going to be multicellular structures. So these are endocrine glands. And within the endocrine glands, normally there'll be secretory vesicles. And an endocrine gland is a gland which produces a hormone, a chemical messenger, that is the product. And they could be in these microscopic vesicles here, producing this product. Now, the thing about endocrine glands is they are very vascular. They're very vascular. So they contain a lot of blood vessels. And going through here, we have a, a capillary. And because they're vascular, there's a blood vessel fairly close by. So there's not a great amount of tissue fluid to get through before the endocrine product can be secreted into the bloodstream. Now, let's suppose that this is a blow up of the vesicle here. And in this vesicle, there's going to be millions of molecules of the individual endocrine hormone. And we see that for the purposes of illustration, this endocrine hormone is spherical. So this endocrine gland and these endocrine cells that comprise the endocrine gland will be releasing their product directly into the blood. So that's the difference. Endocrine glands release their product directly into the blood. Exocrine glands release their product via a duct. So now we see we have molecules of the secretory product from the endocrine gland, which we call a hormone, secreted directly into the blood. And in fact, in the old days, the endocrine system used to be called the ductless gland system because it was a system of glands, but it had no ducts because the product is always secreted directly into the bloodstream. So here we now see we have these endocrine molecules that are in the blood. They are now in the systemic circulation. They're now in the systemic circulation in the blood. That means they'll go to all parts of the body. All parts of the body will be reached by this endocrine product. So this is actually a messenger molecule. These are messenger molecules, or if you like, signal molecules. So you perhaps know that the body communicates via nervous messages very quickly, but it also communicates from one part of the body to another part of the body to control physiology, to maintain homeostasis via these endocrine product products. And these are signal molecules now circulating in the blood. And in the body, we have uh, untold numbers of cells, 70 or 80 trillion cells. And we've noted that this endocrine product is spherical. Now here's a cell in the body. And we notice that on the surface of this cell, there are triangular shaped receptors. They wouldn't literally be triangular shaped, it's diagrammatic. But what they are, these are specific proteins, specific receptor sites for specific signal molecules that will be circulating around the body. And that one's triangular. And uh, this one here, this cell here, has square receptor sites on its cell surface. Again, specific proteinaceous molecules designed to interact with a particular molecule, what's called a ligand molecule, if one comes along. And here we have another cell, and this one's got rounded spherical receptors on its surface. So here's our uh, endocrine hormone, our signal molecule. And it's, uh, it's going through the through this uh, systemic circulation. So there's a, another systemic capillary. And we notice that these body cells are in close proximity with the systemic capillaries. They'll be bathed in tissue fluid, of course. And what will happen is that these signal molecules, these endocrine molecules, will go into the tissue fluids and they will diffuse throughout the tissue fluids. And when that circular signal molecule 
comes to that triangular receptor site, is it going to fit in? Well, of course not. But it will keep diffusing. And when it comes to this square receptor site, is it going to fit in? Of course not. But can you see when it comes to its specific receptor molecule site, it's going to fit in. It's going to fit into that receptor site. And that means we'll have a combination between the receptor molecule protein and the signal molecule. So it's a bit like this lock and key idea, isn't it? The, um, the receptor site would be the lock and the signal molecule would be the key that goes into that lock. And when a signal molecule combines with the receptor protein, there is a chemical bonding between the two. There is a physical chemical bond which is formed. And that chemical bond will be a signal that goes into the cell, to other parts of the cell, like this. So we're going to other parts of the cell. So we could do a blow up of this cell. So here's the, uh, here's the cell with the receptor sites and our signal protein has now bound into these receptor sites. And the combination of the signal and the receptor brings about changes inside the cell. And the changes it brings about inside the cell are described as secondary messenger systems. Secondary messenger systems. So by this way of thinking, the primary messenger system is going to be the hormone circulating around to the tissue cells. And the second messenger system is going to be the biochemical changes that are triggered inside the cell. And these secondary messenger systems are going to trigger changes inside the cell. So, for example, if this was thyroid hormone, which is bound into a thyroid receptor, that's going to trigger secondary messenger systems inside the cell. And that's going to affect, in muscle cells or liver cells, several hundred of these, mitochondria, which are the powerhouses of the cells. And these mitochondria need to produce the right amount of energy so that the cell itself has the right amount of energy to facilitate its physiological processes. And if there's more thyroid hormone bound into the receptor site, the secondary messenger systems will increase the activity of the mitochondria, increasing metabolism. More food will be used, more oxygen will be consumed, more energy will be generated, more ADP will be converted into ATP, more energy will be made and the metabolic rate of the cell will increase. Conversely, if there's less thyroid hormone in the receptor sites, there'll be less to stimulate the mitochondria and the metabolic activity in the cell will go down. But alternatively, we might have been talking about insulin. So this could be an insulin molecule. And of course, insulin is a, is a proteinaceous endocrine hormone. And when the insulin binds onto the insulin receptors, that will bring about changes in the cell membrane. It will actually allow something called a glucose transporter molecule to go to the surface of the cell membrane. And that will actually make a physical hole in the surface of the cell membrane. And that's good because that will allow the, uh, the glucose molecules that are in the tissue fluid, these glucose molecules, this shape, to go through the hole into the cell. And of course they can go to the mitochondria as well, where they can be used in the production of energy. So the glucose molecule C6H12O6 will be gated into the cell. But if the insulin had not bound with its receptor site, had not triggered the secondary messenger system, which caused the glucose transporter molecules to go to the surface, then the glucose will be left in the tissue fluid and in the blood and not getting into the cell, which of course is the irony in diabetes. There's too much glucose in the blood and tissue fluid, but none in the cells. That's, that's why we, uh, we find our patients go ketotic. But again, the point is the insulin has triggered secondary messenger systems 
inside the cell facilitating physiological change. And we can see that this is aimed at maintaining homeostasis. In the case of the thyroid hormone, the homeostasis of metabolism and energy production. In the case of the insulin molecule, homeostasis of glucose. All of things which are needed to regulate and control the cellular environment of the body. So that all the body cells are working together in a coordinated way as a whole organism, not as individual units, being conducted and coordinated by the release of endocrine hormones in just the right amount at just the right time to control just the right amount of physiological process.